Hello? <laughs> we don't have any music on in the background. You have to play something. Now we do. There it is. Hey guys! works out a little bit better because now everybody can see the guitars better since you're on the top of the stream. Oh, this yeah. works. This is great. <laughs> I'm glad that this worked out. I'm super uh, sorry to everyone who's tuning, tuning in and also to, to you folks patiently waiting over there in the, in the shop. Um, but I'm so glad that we ended up working this out. I'm so glad that uh, we are here with you all at Norman's Rare Guitars. Um, my name's Mallory. I'm the social media strategist at Reverb, and I am here to uh, talk to, uh, to, to Michael and Norman about their gear history, about their gear preferences, um, ask them some fun questions that came from Reverb's audience, and also uh, check out some of the coolest stuff that they have at the shop right now. I'm realizing that I look like I'm like, I look like I'm in some kind of a strange French film. <laughs> <laughs> It's working. <laughs> we love you people in France. So <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that, this is going to be really arty today. That's fine. <laughs> um, but first and foremost, wanted to uh, to start out with with some questions that I had for both of you. Um, what was your very first instrument? Um, well, there was one guitar that um, I bought out of an ad in the newspaper, and it was a Gibson L5. And it was by accident, it just said guitar. And I asked what it was, and the lady, apparently her husband was moving to Japan, and they were moving the family to Japan, and told her to sell it. And uh, I said, well, what kind of guitar do you have? And she said, well, it says Gibson. And I said, well, yeah. I said, how much do you want for it? She said, $25. I said, I'll tell you what, sight unseen, I'll give you $20 no matter what it is. <laughs> so she said, fine, come over and get it. And I went to the house, knocked on the door, and they opened the door, and I see this beautiful brown case sitting in the corner. Now, I knew nothing about guitars at this point. This is probably 1967 or somewhere in there, 68. And, uh, but I could tell that that case was something. And it turned out it was a blonde L5 cutaway. Wow. And I ended up buying the guitar and I showed it to some of my friends and everybody went gaga over the thing. And cool. uh, that kind of got me into it. And by the way, you know, uh, Jen and Michael, they were asking me to troubleshoot all the technical problems because they know I'm a technical wizard. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Norm can't think, even text. Right. I got to be honest. I don't even know how to guys. turn a computer on. So, you know, Norm is the least technical person in the world. <laughs> he just so, kept saying, just let the people know we're here. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's good advice. I was like sitting here like, I don't know, what do I do? Just blow on my phone and hope that Instagram works. <laughs> like, yeah. That's funny. Console, kid. <laughs> that's great. Um, I'd say my first uh, purchase is not as cool as Norm's. Uh, I just got a, a, a Squire Strat um, black uh, with, you know, the HSS. Um, and uh, I got it in Philadelphia at Neshaminy Mall. Or it was actually Franklin Mills Mall and uh sam ash and uh yeah and i still have that guitar i was just home in philadelphia recently and i was just playing it and uh so it still it still does a great I job i have that same square strat sitting behind me right now oh Can yeah i can <laughs> kind of see it <laughs> yeah yep. i mean you can't go wrong yep classic <laughs> exactly yeah. i think too my first concert was clapton so i had to get the black and white Strats. Oh, mine's midnight blue. So I just, oh, you know, I, I, I want to be dark, but like a little bit colorful. <laughs> there we go. Um, what's in your What's in your personal collections now? Ooh. Me? Well, Both. I have something that I haven't shown to people, but this is pretty important guitar. 
Um, I have a bunch of stuff out, but I figured out. This, this is crazy. So this is a J200 from 1959. And uh, it's, I call it exorcist green. <laughs> the color. Uh, it's a word color that they made two of them. And the reason that they made two of them, this was actually owned by one of the Everly Brothers. Really and cool. here's a picture over here that Michael's holding of the Everly's back in the day with this guitar. And I think this is one of the most important pieces of memorabilia I've ever owned or seen. Um, the thing that's really, uh, it's got a, a crazy story behind it. Anybody who knows about the Everly Brothers know that they didn't get along. I'm not sure if it was over some woman or what happened, <laughs> you women. You know. So uh, anyhow, uh, they would fight with each other. And this guitar uh, was used to hit the other Everly Brothers over the head. And there's a crack in the guitar that we fixed. Um, and um, so it's a really crazy story. And we have, there's a newspaper article, you know, talking about. I'm holding the time. Yeah. It says, brothers will be brothers. Not sure you heard about the family tiff at the House of Blues the other night when guitarist William Reed of the group Jesus and Mary Jane ceased playing after 15 minutes. He was apparently... Uh, angered uh, because his brother Jim Reed had distracted and was singing lyrics to the song that the band wasn't performing. Uh, and then it says, consequently, the spat came just a bit more than a quarter century after another famous local blow up when singer Phil Everly smashed his guitar and stalked off the stage at Knott's Berry Farm as an artistic comment on Brother Don's performance. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's kind of a crazy story. And the guitar player that was playing with the band um, said to Phil, do you want me to have this fixed? And he said, no, you just keep it. And he's had the guitar for like 55 years, sitting in the closet, just the way it is. So, I mean, the Beatles, their biggest influences were probably the Everly Brothers, all the British bands. I mean, when I was young, the Everly Brothers, it's the most popular duo of all time. So, and classic yeah. harmony, but zero harmony at home, evidently. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah, their very voices important. blended very well. Uh, the guitars didn't blend that well yeah. with each other, especially over the other one's head. <laughs> so, but great story, and it's awesome. really a cool guitar. And I haven't shown this to anybody, but uh, it's something that's in my personal stash. And, uh, you know, I'm not it's sure if I'll sell yeah. it, but uh, it's, it's, I think it was a super important piece of memory. Absolutely. What about you, Lynn? Uh, my collection, well, a lot of people know I, I love the Jazz Master. Uh, that's that's kind of my thing. Oh, do you want to hold this one? Yeah. Um, this is not mine. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I did it again. This <laughs> guitar. But uh, no, so I, uh, my main guitar is what I call a Godzilla, uh, which is actually, um, a lot of people think it's a vintage guitar. It's not. It's, uh, it's like a 20, I got it 20, in 2012, brand new. And uh, it was like a 62 reissue. And uh, um, I don't know, I fell in love with this guitar. And uh, I ended up obviously doing a lot of things to it, but I played it more than anything. I switched out one of the bridge pickups. Um, actually has like a, a PAF in it, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. And then uh, I switched to the green guard and, and everything. But And then there's also guitars that I've been very fortunate to be gifted. Um, which has happened here at Norman's, which is crazy. I have a uh, 65 uh, Fiesta Red Jaguar um, that this uh, this angel Susan gifted me. Um, and then also an uh, Eddie Van Halen uh, custom shop guitar. <laughs> I got a blue 64 Jazz Master that's out of Norman's book. That's, that's the cleanest in the world. Yeah, and it's... these two guys who are our customers love Michael's playing and said, you know, Michael really deserves that guitar because... They knew that Michael loved that guitar. They ended up saying, Michael, this is yours. And yeah. the two guys split it. Really great people. And, Everybody, uh, yeah. So it, it, my collection, needless to say, has changed a lot in the last two years. 
but uh, I'm very uh, humble about it. It's, it's really crazy to be able to play them. I was actually playing the blue one before I got here, and I was just like, wow, it's a dream come true. So it's crazy. Yeah, we actually got a lot of questions coming through from the audience about the Godzilla. Oh, really? That's so funny. Oh, like, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> no, it's funny because anybody who sees that guitar is just, even if they don't play guitar, they're curious about it. And uh, But uh, it, it, it really does have a some kind of voodoo vibe going on with it. Because um, it's funny, I have a, all, this amazing collection, but I still play that guitar the most. And... Uh, um, yeah, it just kind of, I definitely believe if you play a guitar enough, it kind of forms to your, to what you love. And that guitar has done that. So yeah, like a good monster. Yeah, it's a like good monster. By, by the way, Saving the this town. whole place is decked out with Godzilla posters. So, you know, you imagine if he brings a young lady home to the place. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, I'm not sure what the reaction is. What are they Girls saying? Wow. Well, Godzilla. <laughs> well, let, well. To be honest, he didn't help because he just gave me one of those posters, from '66. <laughs> so, but it is true they come over and then they see the monster section, and it's kind, of, it's over from there. <laughs> he's he's not I, a serial killer. No, no. I just. I, like, what is what the Everly Brothers? Were Say that again. The Godzilla is what the Everly Brothers were actually fighting over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. Actually, they're lucky that wasn't the guitar you hit over the head with. That would have been a different story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Godzilla. So Godzilla is actually a girl. Oh. <laughs> People <are> oh. <laughs> okay. Lessons. <laughs> this is all sorts of just like fascinating little fun facts that we're learning today in this stream. <laughs> <laughs> you knew it was going to be wacky with Normans. Yeah. That's, that's why I was excited to join you all today. Um, speaking of wacky things happening in the shop, not necessarily wacky things, maybe wacky people, but your shop is so well known for, um, for curating guitars for Hollywood films because it's an amazing collection and uh, you know your proximity to where so many movies are made. Do you have a story that like sticks in your mind of a movie that you borrowed out a guitar to or rented a guitar to? Well, the very first one that we did was Bound for Glory, which was the Woody Guthrie story. And um, they needed guitars from the 30s and 40s from the Dust Bowl era, and they wanted to have authentic stuff. And they came to us and David Carradine, who was the lead actor in the movie, had actually bought guitars from me before. And he recommended that the uh, prop masters come to me. And we supplied all these instruments that were time correct and all that. And at the very end of the movie, um, he ended up pulling out his own personal Mossman guitar, which was totally out of time context. I had no idea why he did that, but it's the one guitar that you know, in the movie is not correct. But <laughs> I asked David and he just kind of went, eh, I don't know. So that's the way it happened. But we've done, you know, lots of movies like Back to the Future and uh, The Temptation Story, Spinal Tap, Tears, Fall in Love, Spinal Tap. Spinal um, Tap, I mean, come on. That whole room yeah. where he's pointing to his gear is your gear. <laughs> right, well, Chris Guest was a customer of mine prior to the movie Spinal Tap. And he was really more of a folky. I mean, you know, he was into mandolins and Martin My D28s and things like that. And um, when, the, when they got the opportunity to do the movie, um, he said, well, I would like to, you know, use a lot of cool instruments that I know just the place to go. So we've been very lucky. I have a lot of friends. And just being in the right place at the right time, I think, really helped. A lot of music videos, too, he's done, like... Uh, Lindsey Buckingham, did he do that with all yeah. the white fenders? Yeah, he wanted all these fenders uh, that were white with a tortoiseshell pick guard. And I had several at the time, and these were pre-CBS instruments. And I mean, we had to go hunt for more. And uh, I didn't know it, but it was one of Michael's favorite videos. He loved it. Yeah, song. really, really great video. But it's crazy. He's just, he'll tell you stuff and go, oh, yeah, I met Kirk Cobain. It was cool. <laughs> and you're like, wow, okay. <laughs> Have you, ever, have you ever gotten starstruck by somebody who's stopped in the shop or somebody that you've met through? The, the first big star that I ever did business with oh, uh, was George Harrison. 
And I mean, to people my age, I mean, to meet a Beatle, it was, I kept, I was in a car with him and I kept looking at him, like, <laughs> is, is this really you? And uh, what happened was, um, and it's in, I have a book and the story's in the book, but he had a guitar that Eric Clapton gave him and it was stolen from him. And it was sold at a store in Hollywood and they bought it in good faith and they sold it to a guy who was uh, Mexican American who lived part of the year in Mexico, part of the year in America. They were able to contact the guy and let him know that it was George's guitar. And uh, he said, yeah, I'm happy to give it back to George, but I did buy a late fifties Les Paul standard and I would like one in exchange for that, you know, cause I, I did buy it in good faith. And so the guitar store, uh, they started looking all over the place and George was looking all over the place and they contacted this friend of mine at a place called University Music. And he said, well, I know somebody who's got several Les Paul standards from the late fifties and they contacted me. And, uh, you know, it was, it was just really yeah, crazy. In fact, crazy. my friend said, come over here. I have a special customer um, that, uh, you know, for a guitar. And I said, well, what is it? He said, don't worry about it. Just come over here. I said, come on. He said, don't worry about it. Come over. You know, I'll explain it. Because you'll worry if you knew. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I get there and I open the door. And this is about 10 in the morning in West L.A. at the shop. It's called Universal, uh, University Music. And it's just my friend Dale, who is the owner in the shop. And nobody's in there. I go, what's going on? I mean, I just ran out of here, you know, to, to meet you. He said, all right, it's George Harrison. I said, well, where is he? He goes, he's getting a pizza, piece of pizza right next door. <laughs> and he and Mal Evans, who was the Beatles road manager, came walking in. And I took them back to my apartment. I was living in an apartment in Sherman Oaks. And my wife, Marlene, was in the apartment. I, I'll tell you, this is kind of weird. You know, it had an underground parking lot. So we come up from the parking lot. And a couple people saw me walking in with George. And so he came in, he ended up buying two Les Pauls from me and a 57 Strat. And he hammered me and made, him, made me throw in a 57 Princeton amp, Tweed Princeton to the deal. And so we make the deal and, oh, and when we came in, Marlene, uh, I said, George Harrison's coming in. She goes, yeah, right. I said, yeah. And they came walking through the door and Marlene's still in her bathrobe, you know, so she <laughs> never forgave me for that. But, uh, but anyhow, as we leave, we open the door and there's about a hundred people in this uh, like walkway, you know, leading to the apartment. And apparently they told people there's a beetle in here, you know. And uh, so um, 20 years later, 25 years later, a lady comes into my store and she says, um, you know, I remember I lived in that apartment building when you guys lived there. And I said, oh, cool. You know, she said, yeah, I lived there with my sister and my mom. And we were little kids at the time, you know, that this happened. But I mean, the whole building was going nuts because a beetle was in our building. And she says, by the way, uh, my sister is Paula Abdul. Uh, you know, so in L.A., you just never know who you might be living next to. So that's true. It's a crazy story. Yeah. I, for me, I met Eddie Van Halen when I was really young, and that was always my idol. So I kind of got all the, the starstruck thing out of my system. But... Um, it's cool to, to kind of finally have a relationship with Slash when he comes by the shop. I, when I took over Guitar of the Day, he bought the first Guitar of the Day that I sold. Um, and, and then he bought another one, which was a base six, two base sixes. And it was just, that was really crazy uh, moment just because he supported the transition from me, uh, from Mark Ignisi to myself. And uh, that was a really cool moment. And sometimes I get to text him and just say, you know, whatever you know so it's cool that's a humbling moment and uh really cool to have a relationship with him a little bit yeah we said michael there's a phone call for you he yeah. said oh, who is it it's, it's slash and he he's like slash who yeah yeah <laughs> dan said it yeah she's like slash and i was like oh god <laughs> i had no idea what was going on and but it was yeah it, it really was and, and you were wearing a bathrobe <laughs> yeah, yeah. At least I wasn't in the bathroom. <laughs> but uh, it was it was crazy because I was such a, a I was a nervous wreck when I took over the show. And uh, that definitely helped solidify just that I was going the right direction. So it was amazing. That, that brings me to another question that I had, which is how did you all end up finding one another? Ooh. Well, my son actually found Michael 
um, I was in my office and my son came in and he said, um, uh, you got to hear this guy out in the other room there. And I said, yeah, I'll be out in a minute. And he said, no, I think you need to come out now. And I came out and, you know, we love Michael's playing and, you know, we really like Michael very much. And uh, at the time, um, we had, uh, you know, Mark had left and all that. And Michael was almost ready to go back to Philadelphia and kind of give it up. Yeah. yeah and I said, of... don't do that. I said, you know, you can work here at the store and, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, we'll keep you out here until something good happens for you. And a lot of good stuff is happening. Yeah, no, it's crazy. I mean, I, my side of it was that I, my friend Noah, his name's Noah Benedal, and, uh, he said, uh, you got to go to this place, Norman's Rare Guitars. And he said, and I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, just play, you know, and, and, and it's that kind of shop that if you can play, they'll come up to you or, or something. He just said something will happen. And uh, Norm Sutton, like he said, Jordan, uh, they both have great ears. And, and uh, I was just sitting there playing with my uh, bass player, Ben, at the time. And uh, yeah, they came up and then, uh, so I had known Norm for years and we always had a good relationship and uh, I would record with Jordan. And then, uh, yeah, and then we got to the point where uh, I was thinking about going back because the band, you know, it was it's tough being in a band. Um, but yeah, Norm gave me the opportunity and it's crazy, it's changed my life. So uh, I can't say enough about it, but it's, it's definitely my home away from home because I'm, you know, I'm from the East Coast. So. Well, we've been blessed in a lot of ways. Um, just throughout the history of the store, yeah. just being in the right place at the right time, meeting the right people. And, uh, you know, we, you know, we try to recognize great musicians. Right now we are only open Tuesday, Friday and Saturday by appointment because of the pandemic. And we're trying to be real careful for two years. I've been dodging, the, you know, COVID yeah. and, uh, you know, we've been okay. Uh, but we're just not taking any chances. And normally we have people in here playing and we you know, enjoy having them play and all that kind of stuff. But um, we're just, you know, not doing that right now just because we're trying to be extra careful. Yeah. And it, it's a bummer sometimes because we miss having everybody in here. The, we have some of the best jams sometimes on this couch, um, as you see on our YouTube. And some of that camaraderie isn't around because we don't get to let enough people in. But hopefully soon, um, but we're definitely getting through it. And thank God for Reverb for helping us keep these, uh, you know, keeping us alive. Yeah, if it wasn't for our social media and Reverb and all that, um, and there's a lot of people that have wanted to support the store and buy stuff, you know, even if they can't afford a guitar, they'll buy shirts. We have, we have about 30 different designs of our shirts and we sell just a zillion shirts and hats and sweatshirts and all kinds of swag. And all that stuff, I mean, we're really grateful to the people for being so kind to us and That's trying great. to keep us in business. So thank you all for watching and, and helping us stay in. Yeah, really, really. They, they help. Amazing. Yeah. Well, you're a, you've created such a wonderful atmosphere and such a beloved shop over decades and decades that, of course, in any moment when people are able to support you in any way, they're going to step forth and do so. So... I'm glad to, to hear that that's been the case. <laughs> really appreciate that. Yeah. And thank you to everybody. Kind of through your social media presence, you invite them into the shop even when they can't physically be there um, with the guitar of the day. Um, and actually, one of our users had a question about um, if you were worried that you were ever going to run out of guitars of the day. Well, that's my job is to be out there buying good stuff. I mean, I just went to the Dallas Guitar Show and I met some friends there and I bought a lot of guitars to bring back, you know, because I, it's my responsibility to make sure that I bring cool stuff that he can play that keeps the interest of the public, you know. So, and as a lot of people know, um, if I would have predicted about the uh, uh, pandemic, I would have said, well, everybody's going to sell everything and they're going to cash out, put money in the bank and just have money for safety's sake. But just the opposite has happened where people don't want to sell their guitars and they want to buy more guitars. So whether it puts a smile on their face or whatever the reason is, uh, I'm grateful and happy that, that that's happening. But don't ask me for any future predictions because yeah, I would have been yeah, totally really. Wrong. You should have I, seen him. Norm went down to Dallas, Texas, and got all those guitars. So I, hats off to Norm. I mean, he definitely, the challenge is coming up with the ideas for the guitars that he brings in because it's five days a week, and I always want to keep it fresh. And, 
you know, Strat, it can be a killer because you got five pickups <laughs> and then you got to do five songs. So it's, it's a lot, but it, it's you have three pickups for the five. Ways. Well, it depends on what you, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but, um, it's, it's, it's really, uh, it's a good challenge and it's actually made me a better guitar player. Uh, so it's good. Well, it keeps him on his toes because, you know, when he does these Guitar of the Days, he tries to do something that's kind of appropriate for uh, the particular guitar. So, um, you know, you know, instead of playing something totally alien yeah. to the guitar, he wouldn't necessarily be playing classical music on this. But he does stuff that's appropriate for the guitar. But Michael is also one of the most original players. I've ever heard his some of his rhythmic stuff and some of the stuff that he does nobody else does just just for instance just show him some of that oh. stuff that you do with that uh -oh. you know. it's like <laughs> first day I arrived <laughs> <laughs> It's close. <laughs> We're actually calling it Closing Time at Norm's. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. And right. that'll be off uh, my new record that comes out in January, actually. So Nice. Yeah. I was going to ask you about that, because here I am, like a dummy, playing music for, that just came out a couple of months ago when I knew oh, yeah, that yeah. waited for the new one. I appreciate one. that. Oh, um, but yeah, no, that album I, I did uh, over the pandemic, it was a, it was a tough one. To, to get through it because just all the precautions we had to go through and this was in the thick of it. Um, but I do have a new album that's kind of totally different from anything I've done before. It's, it's a little bit more under like the jazz kind of smooth uh, genre. A lot of it's instrumental. Um, and I've had some really, really great uh, musicians and artists, Joe Bonamassa is on the record. Um, so is my teacher Tomo Fujita. Um, so it's going to be great. And so is Norm. Norm's on the organ, even though he doesn't want to admit it. Uh, but uh, One note. No, no, no. He did great. <laughs> and, uh, so that'll all be coming out in January. And I got a little, uh, little record deal uh, with Woodward Records. And uh, so, yeah, we'll see what happens. But a lot of that material that I play on Guitar of the Day is original. So I tried to translate that to this album. So we'll see what happens. You know, what a lot of people don't know about Michael is he, he's a great rock player. But he also went to Berkeley and, um, you know, so he can play all kinds of other music, jazz. The, the jazz is actually, the jazz record is more of a smooth jazz. Yeah, it's and, smoother. But it's yeah. really cool. And his producer, Paul Brown, uh, yeah, also produced George Benson and a lot of other people. Yeah, he produced George Benson. He just did a record actually with Larry Carlton. Um, you can check out. Um, and it, it's just, the audio is unbelievable. The arranging is unbelievable, and uh, I think it'll be a real treat, but definitely something different than anything I've put out before. <laughs> Are you saying that the audio is better than, like, watching an Instagram live stream? This yes. recording? Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> we have a $3 microphone that we use here, because I've spared no expense. <laughs> I don't even have a microphone. I've spared all of it. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, more questions. Be both. Uh, it was a breeze. Have any Hello. stories? No, no. Are we still there? It got away. <laughs> what? What? Say uh -oh. it again. Oh, do you have any stories about like the guitar that got away? Like something that you had once, played once, owned once that uh, you parted ways with, and you kind of wish that you hadn't. Well, I have like a thousand stories of things that I sold back in the day that I wish I still had that 
I was kind of a little premature, including there was a time I had 14 Sunburst Celeste balls, and I thought that they couldn't possibly get any higher, and they got a lot higher. And then there was also, at the time that I was dealing with George Harrison, he was tired of using his Gretsch guitars, and he offered me his Country Gentleman, which is a guitar that he's really famous for. That would have to be a million dollar guitar these days. Um, and I told him, at first I didn't think anybody would believe that I dealt with George Harrison, because this is before I had a store or anything. And I wasn't a big fan of Gretsch guitars at the time. And uh, that was a real brilliant move on my part. <laughs> That's that's the tough. Yeah, one. I was. A, I mean, I, I could have retired off that guitar, probably. <laughs> uh, for me, I'd say two come to mind. One, the first one is my first Les Paul. It was just a Les Paul Junior, uh, or a Les Paul Studio Light, I should say, actually. And uh, I got it um, for probably my thirteenth or twelfth birthday, and it was just a moment I'll never forget. Um, and it just, I don't know, it was like my first real, real guitar. And uh, I missed that one. And also the first guitar I got from uh, Norms, which was like this big ES-150. It was like a walnut guitar. But I miss it just because, I don't know, it was the first one that caught my eye when I started working here. And uh, it was a really cool guitar. So. Nice. For people who are purchasing brand new guitars now, do you have any advice about something that they should look for in a new guitar that might increase its value as it ages and becomes vintage? You know, I think the most important thing is, is that the guitar means something to whoever's buying it. I mean, you know, don't buy it because somebody says you should buy this, you should buy that. If a guitar inspires you and every time you walk past it, you pick it up and play it, that's a good sign. But if you're buying it for investments, there's a lot of things that we call like sleepers that have not quite gone as crazy as some of the other stuff. And jazz masters are one of them. Um, those guitars have been overlooked for a long time. Now they're starting to creep up and people are starting to realize what great guitars they are. A lot of it yeah. due to Michael. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. They're, these are coming to the forefront. I even see star casters a little bit more and, uh, um, but I think what I notice here at the shop is uh, the classic stuff really holds. Like if they don't put too many switches on it, you know, and a lot of these mods, it's hard to reinvent the wheel. And uh, that's why you still see strap bodies. You still see even with the boutique brands. Um, but I think that like I've noticed through Norm, he orders a lot of like what is vintage correct. And that stuff, I think, just isn't going anywhere because there's it, it's the root of it is so solid so I, I noticed that yeah it's not based on a fad and you know these companies uh by accident or whatever they invented the wheel and it's pretty hard to improve upon some of the uh, designs that uh, you know gibson fender and martin you know they there's always like these uh, what we call sort of like a renaissance for like for gibson for gibson electrics the Renaissance really was from about 57 to about 64, 65 for some of the greatest stuff that they've ever built. And uh, then they started trying to figure out how they could save money and they would do certain things and they'd save $2 on a switch or they would do something yeah. uh, that would be less expensive. And eventually they ended up making the guitars not quite as good as their original designs. And then all of a sudden people started uh, you know, paying more money for these old guitars. And I think the companies kind of woke up and went, well, why are we selling a new guitar? And people want the old ones and they're paying more money for the old ones. It was because the design of the old ones was so great. So now they're doing a lot of these reissues. They're trying to recapture what they once did. I think Gibson's doing a great job. At yeah, that Gibson's too. doing a great job. Fender's doing Fender's a really doing good a great job. job. Everybody, you know, yeah. Rick and Becker. I mean, a lot of them, Martin, they're all kind of you know, coming to the party and they're listening more to what the players are asking for. You know, in, in the beginning, they try to get ideas from the players as to what the players want. And then what ends up happening is then they start listening to people that are saying, well, we could save $2 if we did this, we could save $5 if we did that. And eventually it goes to the side. And I think the companies now are really trying to listen back to what the players really want. And people like Joe Bonamassa, who is, you know, our 
part of the family here at Norm's. He's been very integral because he's a young man, but he knows about the old guitars and he knows what was great about them. And he can kind of, he's articulate and he can tell people what yeah, you know was done great. and what's great. And he even has some of these like Epiphone guitars that are made um, that are really cool guitars for the money. If you don't have the money to buy uh, full on American uh, Gibson or a vintage reissue, some of these Epiphones are really good and they're a thousand dollars or less. And so um, well, he had those great flying V's, right? That's yeah. all Amos. Yeah. Those Amos were Epiphone. V's. And, right. um, but yeah, and I also think that people are just more educated now, you know, so they, on the vintage stuff, you know, through reverb, through our channel, through all these different outlets. So, you know, now people know what bridge was probably originally on there or what string tree to that, you know, or pickups. And so I think it keeps the companies honest as well, because everybody's, you know, looking at this stuff. So um, it's a, it's a cool time because I think everybody's working together, the companies and the, and the players. And it's cool. You know what, this is a, a guitar that um, is, on our reverb site. And this is a newer model that they're making. Um, this is a Gibson J200 Oriante model. And Ori is a really close friend of his store. And we love Ori. She's like one of the <laughs> great guitar players ever. And um, so they did these guitars for her. And uh, we asked Ori when she was in to maybe play them. And she signed this guitar. Right up uh, here. Yeah, right over here. So um, this is actually signed by Ori. And so it's a cool piece of memorabilia and it's a really good instrument. Michael, play a little something. Yeah, it sounds there. great. Open chords. It's a really cool guitar. Sounds really good. It's got a great pickup system in there. It really does, it's, yeah. Uh, ready to go if you're playing live gigs and all that. And uh, so this one, and it's custom, and it's Gibson custom, and it's signed by her. And uh, you know, these are really good guitars. This is probably one of the most popular um, artist endorsement guitars that Gibson makes. Yeah. Yeah. Be happy to come in and we'll get more if we'll sign them too. But here's a cool piece of memorabilia and a cool instrument right here on Reverb at Norm Jerry Yeah, no doubt. Awesome. I would love to see some more of the 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 guitars that, that you've got in the Reverb shop if you have some of them handy that are some of your yeah, personal yeah. favorites. There is some that we just recently acquired that um, we haven't really even been able to inventory yet because you have so many things. But um, Michael, what do you think? Yeah, well, this is a uh, 1958 That's precision bass. And so this is a uh, 58, it's original, very nice condition, original anodized gold guard, uh, raised uh, pole piece on a pickup, maple neck, uh, three-tone sunburst. These are some of the best Fender bases that Fender ever made. Here's another one that's on reverb. This is a 1955 Hartel Stratocaster. Um, really, really great. Has a big sound. Um, but, you know, Joe Bonamassa, who comes through all the time, loves the Hartels. I got to say, they've grown on me a lot. Um, Less weight. They stay in tune really well. But just a killer, killer guitar. Um, this is one that will be on reverb shortly. Um, this is a uh, all rosewood Telecaster, and this is a '71 that I just recently acquired. That's like the George Harrison Let It Be guitar, and it's all rosewood and um, just really, really cool guitar. Um, yeah, and this one's not too heavy either. Yeah, and they the thing is is that they've reissued these several times. Um, they did a custom shop reissue. 
Uh, one that we're actually holding for our friend Sean Stockman from Boys to Men. Um, this other one is available now, and it's uh, an original one, the first edition. So just a very cool guitar. This is a 1960 ES335 in Cherry. Um, doesn't get more classic than that, especially in Cherry. Um, I believe, you know, it has the two PAFs, uh, Monster Pickups, Amber Switch Tip, uh, but this guitar is absolutely killer. Uh, yeah. What do you get? Uh-oh. And this is the ultimate in a Gibson mandolin. This is an F5 1923 Lloyd Lore mandolin. And this is pre Verzi. They had like a tone enhancer, which it's not as popular as the ones without them. And this one is in beautiful condition. And this is 1923 original and really nice shape. Wow. Just an amazing instrument. What do we got here, Norm? Okay, so this is a 1928 Gibson L4 guitar. This guitar should be in the Gibson Museum. I mean, they should definitely uh, be inquiring about this. Um, what's really unusual about it, it's the oval hole, uh, large sound hole, arch top. But what's really crazy is it has the same headstock as that mandolin. Yeah. It's got the, the uh, Gibson torch up top, the V Gibson, and the curlicue and all that. This is a one of a kind that was made in 1928. Wow. And very cool guitar. Eventually, what this guitar evolved to is that blonde guitar over there. Right here? Yeah. This is a sharp look. So this is a 50s L4C. It was this model eventually uh, evolved into an F-hole guitar, non-cutaway. And then this is where it went to the cutaway. And this thing is hardly played. Oh, my God. It's just incredible. Wow. Blonde, blonde finish, which I love. What else we got, Norm? So, speaking of blonde guitars, this is a blonde D'Angelico XL. And John D'Angelico was the premier boutique guitar maker to the jazz stars. I mean, the guys that played with Matt King Cole, Irving Ashby, and, uh, you know, all, all the top players really wanted these guitars. The wood on this guitar is just absolutely ridiculous. And, um, and I bought this guitar years ago, uh, and uh, I was buying some other guitars, and the guy um, who I bought, one, one other guitar was like a 59, Fender Strat that I still have, a slab board, very early. And um, it, it's funny because, you know, when things are close to you, people don't realize how important they are. Um, it, I was almost ready to leave after buying several guitars and he said, you know, I have this other guitar. You might not know what it is. This was years, years ago. You know, he said, it's a D'Angelico guitar. And I kind of went, yeah. And mm -hmm. he kind of brought it out. And he said, but, you know, you may not want it because up on top here, it says Bob with a heart. And he said, John D'Angelico was my uncle. And he made this guitar for my 13th birthday. Yeah. And uh, he said, but I'm not really playing. And you know, I ended up buying it. And, uh, you know, so, you know, when something is made by a family member or something like that, a lot of the times you're so close to it, they don't realize how important it is. I and thought that you paid a lot of money for it, but. Sorry. I thought you said mom, like mom in the heart. Oh, mom. Like, no, not mom. <laughs> Bob. B -O -B. Oh, Bob. Mom. Like Bob. Like bopping for apples. Yeah. That'd be cool. As a gear, you want to take this one? Yeah. I'll grab the bases. And then this is a Series 1 Telecaster thin line. So this is the Telecaster, the hollow body version that they did. The very first ones have the regular Telecaster pickup setup with the uh, single coils. And uh, the Series 2, they went to humbucking pickups, and they were, um, uh, they just referred to it as a Series 2 Telecaster thin line. So we have one of those, too, in the back. Here's some p base action. I don't have one, but I love a thin line Telecaster. I pick one up. Well, I do, too. 
they're real cool. And if you have a bad back, they're pretty cool for that too. So yeah, um, this is a Sting. It's a 1955 or six. I don't have a tag here. Uh, precision bass. This is the second series of the precision bass. The very first ones were like a Telecaster, and they had sharp edges, and they were mostly like the blonde finish with the black guards. This one here, they went to the contoured body. And so they're a little easier to hold up against you. Same pickup, same pickup as they had on the black guard early ones. And then in 57, they started going to this. This one is a 58. It's a 58. But anodized they used guard. anodized guard with the split pickup. So it kind of evolved from the thicker body Telecaster to this, which is a contoured body. body. They call it a Tele P base too. And then this is where it eventually evolved to. And once they got this design down, it's remained over. from yeah. there. I want to quick. I've seen a lot of comments being like, wow, look at all these left handed. I wanted to just say, oh. trim flip it. So these are all right handed that I. These are all right handed. <laughs> by the way, I'm left handed. I'm left handed and I learned to play right handed because when I was a kid, you had to wait a year and a half or something to get a lefty guitar. But we do have a number of left handed we do, yeah. guitars. We've got a nice Les Paul, not old. Uh, we have a Rickenbacker. a Rickenbacker, like a Candy Apple Red 360. Uh, Rickenbacker and left handed, which is very cool. A Depinto, um, like an L.A.D. Easton kind yeah. of guitar. We got some guitars from L.A.D. Easton from the cars, you know. And um, I've had, I had a left handed D'Angelico that Al McKay got from Earth, Wind and Fire. Um, I uh, have had, you know, uh, early 335s. I sold one to Cesar Rosas from Los Lobos. Um, I've had, I had one uh, Sunburst Les Paul in 1960. And I can't say for sure, but I believe that's a guitar that Paul McCartney owns now, because I think there was only four of them and left-handed in 1960. It's got a lot of use out of that guitar. Things. Wow. Yeah. So um, I bought it in Miami. I was actually in a music store, and I was asking if they had any old guitars, and there was a guy standing next to me. And uh, I said, um, you know, what do you have in old, old guitars? And this other guy heard me. And he said, are you looking for old guitars? I said, yeah. He said, well, I have an old Les Paul, but I'm left-handed. It's a left-handed guitar. And I said, well, I'd be very interested in it. And I've had so many people tell me yeah, I have a Les Paul standard flame top or whatever. And I always take it with like a grain of salt. I never really quite believe it. But I said, listen, I'm staying in this building, um, you know, this hotel, and I'm in room. And I gave him the room number. And I said, uh, you know, if you really want to sell it, bring it to my room in the morning at 10 o'clock. And I forgot completely about it. I didn't think that I'd ever see the guy. I thought it was just kind of a bunch of bull. And 10 o'clock, the doorbell rings, and they had like a little peephole in the door in the doorbell. And I looked through, and I could see the guitar through that. I was going, oh, my <laughs> this God. This is it. And I, it's, I've sold it, you know, 25, 30 years ago, and it's probably gone through a few different hands. But I kind of believe that's the one that George had. Or Paul, you mean? Oh, uh, Paul, sorry. Totally. Yeah, I always, I always make the same joke as a left, as a left-handed person, um, that all of my, all of my effects pedals are left-handed. I'm like, oh yeah, I only buy left-handed effects pedals. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's funny. People will be like, oh, do they make those? And then I'm like, I'm here all week. Good night. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> And when somebody's playing a left-handed guitar in the store here, I always walk up to them and go, you're playing that guitar backwards. Yeah, yeah. We love hearing that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, it's, there were so many people here that were excited. Like, I didn't know that Lemo played lefty. And I was just like, oh, children. <laughs> oh, we lost you. Yeah, we oh, lost you there. I was. I said there was. I've seen so many comments uh, where people were like, "I didn't know Lemo was a lefty." Oh no, yeah. He, Sorry, let he's down. Not, no a lefty. <laughs> My father's a lefty. lefty. But he yeah. didn't play guitar because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Lemo is my father. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, actually, since we're talking, since we, we got to see so many cool uh, vintage Gibsons, I actually have a little uh, fun game for all of us to play if you have a little bit of time to spare. Okay. Um, 
it's a game that I am going to uh, I'm going to call. Is it a real Gibson finish, or did I make that up? And uh, we're going to do <laughs> lightning rounds. That I'm going to direct at at the two of you, uh, Norman and Michael. Um, so I'm just going to name a finish. It's either a real Gibson finish or I made it up and you just have to make the call. Um, so we're going to do a couple of those. And then the very last one is going to be a multiple choice. And I'm going to be taking a peek at the comment section um, to see who can answer it correctly first. And whoever answers it correctly, I will call out their handle and they can DM at Reverb. Um, and we will give you a $10 gift card for the site that you can use towards purchases in Norm's Reverb Shop. <laughs> cool, cool. Awesome, so let's get going. Real Gibson finish, or did I make this up? Anaconda burst. Are you asking us? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, You know, they come up with all these names for all these colors. I'm not sure. We're we're really more into the Godzilla verse. Oh, so, God. I'm I gonna mean, go with answer. I'm gonna go with just because the irony. Yes, it's real. It is a real Gibson finish. Yeah. Oh, good job. Well, that's, that's, Godzilla finish. that's real too. <laughs> you know, they'll Our build anything you want if you're willing to pay for it. <laughs> Second up, foggy sky burst. No. What do you think, Norm? Well, no? it's blue. It, doesn't, it just doesn't ring. No. Foggy sky? You know. Oh, I hope it's not, because then I just dissed it. I'm going <laughs> to say, yeah, because I think they'll do anything. You, know? you, you can call it You can call it Michael Lemo if you want, you know, if, you, you know, if you create that. Don't color. worry about your Gibson sponsorship for the Godzilla Burst, Foggy Sky Burst. We love is them, but no. <laughs> it is or no? Is What's it or I made it up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Red hot tamale. For Gibson. Red hot tamale. Kind of looks like that uh, Oriente guitar. That has a ring to it. <laughs> Red hot tamale. Come on, I'm Come two on, for answer, two. Uh, answer, Norm, yes or no? I'm going to go with yes. I'm going to have to agree with Limo for a change. It is a real Gibson finish. Woo! Wow. <laughs> I was thinking of adding VOS on the end of it, but I was like, I feel like they'll get it. I feel like they'll know without yeah, VOS. Yeah, that would have done it. VOS would have made it an, an untrue, I think. Um, okay, Tranquility Blue Burst. Ooh. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, though, it, the pattern's been every other, so I'm going to go with yes, it's real. It is real. Yes! <laughs> Good job, guys. Good job. Okay, we'll do one more, one more of the, this, like, lightning round um, before we ask people to, to answer with their, uh, their best guess. Um, so the final one for you two will be Black Kettle Fade. Black Kettle Fade. 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 Fade? Yeah. I'm going to say yes. yes, too. Yeah. I made that one up. <laughs> oh! Yeah. oh! He got stuck. It was the fade. It was the fade. It was the Mallory finish. Uh, I always just started to <laughs> I wanted to just be undefeated. <laughs> so close. You're All right. Diabolical. <laughs> Uh, I will ask the audience, and then also after after we get a correct answer from them, take your take your temperature. Since I don't think you can see the comments, right? Jen's reading the comments. Um, they right. could they could see it a little bit. Okay, well, don't read the comments. Your face. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this one is for the folks that are streaming from home. Um, I will give you four options, and the first person to type the correct answer. Um, DM, I'll, I'll shout out your handle, you DM Reverb, and I will send you a code for $10 off your next purchase. All right, here we go. Which one of these is not a real Gibson finish? Royal Tea Burst, Tomato Soup Burst, Lemon Poppy Seed Burst, or Danger Burst? Give people a little time. Royal tea burst, 
tomato soup first, lemon poppy seed first, or danger burst? Aiden, Aiden underscore Phil, you are the correct, uh, first person you got the correct answer. C, lemon poppy seed burst is one that I made up. <laughs> Everything else is true, including tomato soup burst, everyone is a real Gibson Everybody it. was putting tomato soup. Yes, yeah, so I could see that. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just say one more thing. You know, Reverb is a fantastic company. They have a lot of money. $10, come on, you guys. I'll put you on the spot. I'll put David <laughs> Kopp and the rest of the Reverb. I don't know him. Come on, you guys. I don't know him. <laughs> All right, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Coming out of my paycheck, guys. It's not coming out of my paycheck. Yeah, it would but... be controversial if it wasn't Norm. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much um, for for joining me today, or for me for joining you, for allowing me to join you today, um, in spite of all of the Instagram drama that was happening earlier this afternoon. Um, Aiden underscore Phil, make sure that you contact at Reverb for your discount code. Um, beyond that, I wanted to pass it back over to you and uh, see if there were any other instruments you wanted to show off or if uh, Michael wanted to play us out. Oh, yeah. Michael could play us out. But let's just say this, because I feel so bad with you guys doing a $10 thing. Get Aiden to contact us and we'll give him one of our T-shirts, too. Because, I mean, you know, we're going to step up. Come on, Reverb. <laughs> again. Bye, guys. Thanks, Mallory.